Ghost Speech, Chapter 4. Believe in ghosts? No way, Terry told her. I kept my mouth shut. I knew that ghosts weren't supposed to be real, but what if all the scientists were wrong? There are so many ghost stories from all around the world, how can ghosts not be real? Maybe that's why I sometimes get scared when I'm in strange places. I think I do believe in ghosts. Of course, I will never admit this to Terry. She is always so scientific. She laughed at me forever. The three sat where Kiss had clustered together. Come on, do you guys really believe in ghosts? Terry asked. Louisa took a step forward. Sam tried to pull her back, but she brushed him off. If you go near that cave, you might change your mind, she said, narrowing her eyes. You mean there are ghosts in there? I asked. What do they do? Come out at night or something? Louisa started to reply, but Sam interrupted. We've got to go now, he said. Scooting this reverend just to pass us. Hey, wait! I called. We want to hear about the ghosts. They hurried on. I could see Sam yelling angrily at Louisa. I guess he was upset because she mentioned the ghosts. They disappeared down the beach. Then from inside the cave we heard that long, low whistle again. Terry stared at me. It's the wind, I said. I really didn't believe that. Terry didn't believe it either. Why don't we ask Ryan Agatha about the cave? I suggested. Good idea, Terry said. Even she looked a little scared now. Brad and Agatha's cottage was a short walk from the cave. It perched by itself on the edge of the pine forest, looking out toward the lighthouse. I ran to the heavy wooden front door and pushed it open. I peered around the tiny front parlor. The old house creaked and groaned as I walked over the sagging floorboards. The ceiling hung so low I could touch it when I stood on tiptoe. Terry came up beside me. Are they here? I don't think so. I answered, looking around. We stepped past the old sofa and white stone fireplace and into the cramped kitchen. Off the kitchen stood an old storeroom where I, where I was asleep. Upstairs was Brad and Agatha's room with a crawl-through passage into the space above the storeroom, which would be Terry's room. A tiny back staircase led from Terry's room down to the yard. Terry turned to the window. There they are, she said, in the garden. I could see Brad bent over a tomato stalk. Agatha was hanging some clothes to dry on a clothesline. We raced out to the kitchen door. Where have you two been? Agatha demanded. She and Brad both had white, white hair, and their eyes seemed faded and tired. They were so frail and light. Between them, I don't think they weighed more than a hundred pounds. We explored the beach, I told them. I knelt down beside Brad. He was missing the top part of two of fingers on his left hand. He told us that he got caught in the wolf trap when he was young. We found an old cave with some huge rocks. Have you ever seen it? I asked. He gave a little grunt and kept searching for ripe tomatoes. It's right by the beach and the big rock jetty, Terry added. You can't miss it. Agatha's sheets flutter on the line. It's nearly supper time, she said, ignoring her questions about the cave. Why don't you come inside and give me a hand, Terry? Terry glanced at me and shrugged. I turned back to Brad. I was about to ask him about the cave again when he handed me the basket of ripe tomatoes. Take it to Agatha, okay? Sure. I answered, following Terry inside. I set the basket on the small counter. The kitchen was small and narrow, counter and sink on one side, sofa and refrigerator on the other. Agatha had already put Terry to work in the corner of the living room, setting the table. Now, Terry, dear, Agatha called from the kitchen, if it's asters you're after, the best place to find those is in the big meadow down past the lighthouse. Of course, they're just coming out about now, so you can take your pick, your pick there. I believe that's where you could find plenty of goldenrod, too. Great! Terry called back with her usual enthusiasm. I don't know how she could get so pumped about flowers. Agatha knows the basket of tomatoes on the counter. Oh, gracious! All those tomatoes! She opened a raggedy old drawer and pulled out a small knife. Why don't you cut these up for a big green salad? I must have made a face. Don't you like salad? Agatha asked. Not really, I said. I mean, I'm not a rabbit. Agatha laughed. <laughs> You're absolutely right, she said. Why ruin a homegrown tomato with lettuce? Why have them plain, with maybe a little dressing? Sounds good, I grinned, picking up the knife. I listened to Agatha and Terry discuss wildflowers for a few minutes to see if the subject of the cave would come up again. It didn't. I wonder why my two old cousins didn't want to talk about it. After dinner, Brad pulled out an old deck of playing cards and taught Terry and me how to play whist. It's an old-fashioned game. 
that I'd never heard before. Brock got a kick out of teaching us the rules. He and I played against Terry and Agatha. Every time I got mixed up, which was most of the time, he'd wag his finger back and forth at me. I guess it saved him from having to say anything. We went to bed after the card game. It was early, but I didn't care. It had been a long day, and I was glad to get some rest. The bet was hard, but I fell asleep as soon as my head hit the scratchy feather pillow. The next morning, Terry and I made our way to the woods to collect plants and wallflowers. What is it we're looking for again? I asked Terry as he kicked the side piles of dead leaves. Indian pipe, Terry replied. It looks like small pinkish white bones popping out of the ground. It's also called corpse plant because it lives on the remains of dead plants. Yuck! I still remember the popping hands in my cemetery dream. Terry laughed. You should like these plants, she said. They're a scientific puzzle. They're white because they don't have any chlorophyll. You know, that stuff that makes plants turn green. How interesting, I said sarcastically, rolling my eyes. Terry continued her lecture anyway. Agatha said Indian pipe only grows in very dark places. It looks more like a fungus than a plant. She dug around for a few minutes. The weirdest thing about these plants, she continued, is if they dry out, they turn black. That's why I want to try pressing a few. I poked around in the leaves some more. I have to admit, she had me hooked. I love freaks in nature. I peered up at the heavy leaf canopy above us. We're definitely as deep into the woods as we can be. Are you sure this is where Agatha said you can find them? Terry nodded. She pointed to a huge fallen oak tree. That's our landmark. Don't lose it. I started toward the big tree. Maybe I'll take a closer look over there, I said. There might be Indian pipe on that dead tree. I knelt down by the snake-like tree roots and began carefully pushing dead leaves aside. No wildflowers. Just bugs and worms. It was really gross. I glanced back at Terry. She didn't seem to be having any luck either. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something white sticking out of the ground. I scurried over to examine it. A short plant stem stuck up from the soft ground. The stem was covered with rolled up leaves. I tugged at the stem. It didn't come up. I pulled harder. The stem rose a little, bringing a clump of soft dirt with it. It isn't a stem, I realize. It's some kind of root. A root with leaves. Weird. I pulled more of it up from the ground. It was very long, I discovered. A hard tug, then another. Another hard tug of the strange root brought up a huge amount of dirt. I glanced down to the large hole I made and uttered a sharp cry. Terry, come here! I managed to choke out. I found a skeleton!